Let's continue. We have another reason to believe that Cervantes has lodged a political agenda in this episode. Now the state imposes itself, both symbolically and literally. First, one of the servants of Luis's father insists on the truth. Nobody on earth can convince me to think anything other than that this is just a barber's basin and that nothing but an ass's saddle. The priest throws out another naive comment. It could well be that of a donkey, but the servant responds with an expression that carries imperialist connotations, tanto monta. Besides meaning it's all the same, the phrase refers directly to the founding of the modern Spanish state by the Catholic kings Ferdinand and Isabella, whose motto was tanto monta, monta tanto. The motto refers to what Alexander the Great is supposed to have said before cutting the Gordian knot and assuming control of the Greek Empire. At this point, one of the officers, full of rage and anger, said, that's a saddle or I'm not my father's son and anyone who has said or would say otherwise must be hammered drunk. Don Quixote then attacks him with his lance and had the officer not ducked, he would have been laid out flat. So chaos breaks out at the inn once again. It's something like a scene from a film by the Three Stooges. The innkeeper goes for his staff and his sword. Don Luis's servants surround him, and Don Quixote brandished his sword and lunged at the officers. Interestingly, Luis now changes his mind and orders his servants to assist Don Quixote. Another pitched battle ensues, and Cervantes' description deploys another of the novel's major metaphors, the labyrinth. And note how Don Quixote's imagination compares the violent guests to a certain group of Moors in a scene from Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. The entire inn was shouts, hollers, screams, confusion, fear, shock, slips, slashes, punches, blows, kicks, and bloodshed. And in the midst of this chaos, this mechanized labyrinth of things, Don Quixote's memory suddenly told him that he had fallen head over heels into the discord at the encampment of Agramante. The irony here is that according to Don Quixote's comparison, the guests are all pagans. If the inn represents a microcosm of the Andalusian labyrinth, then the war that occurs there is the civil war that breaks out among the Moorish enemies of Charlemagne in Ariosto's mock epic. Miraculously, it is none other than Don Quixote who imposes peace. Everyone hold, everyone gird your sword, everyone settle down, all hear me if you all wish to live. And his logic is impeccable. I want you to see with your own eyes how what has happened here and what has moved among us is the discord of Agramante's encampment. Behold how we all fight each other and we don't understand each other. Come now, Sir Judge, and your worship, Sir Priest. Let one serve as King Agramante and the other as King Sobrino and put us all at peace. Because by God Almighty, it's a great knavery that so many people of our stature should be killing each other over such pointless causes. So Don Quixote imposes peace as did Ariosto's two Moorish kings. But discord arises again when the officer who was most thrashed and kicked by Don Fernando recalled that among some warrants that he had for the arrest of certain delinquents, there was one against Don Quixote, whom the Holy Brotherhood had ordered to be arrested for having freed the galley slaves. The description of the officer is another narrative marvel, setting himself to reading slowly because he was not a good reader. After every word he read, he looked up at Don Quixote, comparing the description in the arrest warrant with Don Quixote's face, and he found that, without a doubt, he was the one invoked by the warrant. Attention all libertarians and anarchists, this is your passage in Don Quixote. This is the moment when our romantic hero, with all his strength and all his soul, proclaims an individual's freedom against physical coercion. 
when the officer accuses him of being a highway robber and seized Don Quixote by the collar so forcefully that he could not breathe, the reaction of our Hidalgo is magnificent. His anger reaching its climax and the bones of his body creaking with all his strength, he grabbed the officer's throat with both hands and if his companions had not come to his rescue, Don Quixote would not have surrendered his victim until he had taken his life. Cervantes' great novel is first and foremost a work of art, so any minimally viable interpretation deserves to be heard. Let's try to imagine Cervantes, the one-armed man of Lepanto, forgotten in the prison camps of Algiers and never recognized for his sacrifice. Imagine an author who not only fought in the most glorious victory over the Turk, but who also understood that Don Juan of Austria's broken promise to free the galley slaves of the Christian fleet was a disgrace, a national shame, perhaps the greatest disillusionment of all. Literature is beautiful precisely because it resists absolute interpretations. So I don't want to stifle anyone else's opinion. Nevertheless, I want to offer mine here at this crucial moment. I think Cervantes was deeply offended by the blatant hypocrisy, the betrayal of not freeing the galley slaves after the Battle of Lepanto. Listen to Don Quixote's reaction to the officer's accusation. Come hither, foul and evil-born mob. You call highway robbery giving liberty to those in chains, unleashing prisoners, aiding the wretched, lifting up the fallen, remedying the needy? It's as if he's saying, bring it on. You want a piece of me? And vindicating his release of the galley slaves, Don Quixote not only categorically undermines the authority of the king's representatives, he also unleashes an anti-tax harangue. Come hither, you gang of thieves, not officers, you highway robbers, acting at the license of the Holy Brotherhood. Tell me, Who's the ignoramus who signed a warrant of arrest against a knight like me? Who's ignored the fact that knights errant are exempt from all jurisdictional charters and that their laws are their swords, their charter, their valor, their code, their will? Who's the fool, I say, who does not know there's no Hidalgo edict with so much preeminence and so many exemptions as that which a knight errant acquires the day he's dubbed a knight and commits himself to the harsh travails of chivalry. What knight errant ever paid a poll tax, a duty, a queen's pin money, a king's dues, a toll, or a ferry? At the end of this defense, of a knight's legal rights, we find the same anti-bourgeois tendencies and the same sexual fantasies we have come to associate with Don Quixote. But now, they take a rebellious and anti-monarchical turn. What tailor ever took payment for the clothes he made for him? What king would not seat him at his table? What damsel did not fall in love with him and surrender herself wholly to his will and pleasure? And finally, what knight errant has there ever been, is there, or will there ever be in all the world who does not have the metal to deliver all by himself 400 blows to 400 officers of the Holy Brotherhood if they should appear before him? Did I mention that Cervantes and sometimes even Don Quixote are my heroes?